Hello. Hello, can people hear me? I hope so. I'm Jeannie Seiler. Whoops. Let's see. That's not working. Speaker view. Hello. Hi, I'm Jeannie Seiler, director of the Virginia Humanities Fellowship Program. And we're happy you've joined us for the start first of our fall semester 2020 version of what has been a long time tradition of presenting scholars and their research and writing in the public humanities. Today we have with us Tom Capsidelis. Tom Thomas P. Capsidelis is a veteran Virginia journalist and author of After Virginia Tech, Gun Safety and Healing in the Era of Mass Shooting, published in 2019 by the University of Virginia Press. He was an editor for 28 years at the Richmond Times Dispatch before accepting a fellowship with Virginia Humanities in 2016 to complete his book. Capsidelis was formerly the Richmond Bureau Manager for the United Press International, UPI, and a reporter for the state newspaper of Columbia, South Carolina. Capsidelis graduated from the University of Maryland in 1977 and the MFA program in creative nonfiction at Goucher College in 2014. He's been a visiting assistant professor of journalism at the University of Richmond and an adjunct instructor at Virginia Commonwealth University. In March of this year, he was inducted into the Virginia Communications Hall of Fame. Tom and his wife, Karen, who's retired from the Times Dispatch, have lived in Richmond since 1981. Please welcome Tom Capsidelis today. Jeannie, thanks so much for your kind introduction and for inviting me to speak. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in. I'm gonna take a moment here to uh, share my screen. I'd like to especially thank uh, Virginia Humanities for my residential fellowship in 2016 and 2017, which allowed me to complete the research and writing of my book. And a special thanks today also to Trey Mitchell, who's brought us all together technologically. I spent half of my fellowship year in Charlottesville and the other half at the Library of Virginia in Richmond, where I researched the archives and emails of Governor Tim Kaine's administration in the aftermath of the shootings at Virginia Tech. I'm really grateful for all the connections that I've made here from the many humanities fellows and colleagues who helped shape and influence my work to having after Virginia Tech be part of the Virginia Festival of the Book. I'd like to also express thanks to Virginia Humanities Executive Director Matthew Gibson and his predecessor, the late Rob Vaughn. I was a fellow in Rob's last year and in looking over some of the stories written about him during his long career, I was struck by an answer he gave to an interviewer in 20, 2003. It was a, an interview with very brief questions uh, designed to elicit very brief answers. Rob was asked, what creeps you out about life in the 21st century? His answer was vulgarity and violence. Sadly, we're continuing to deal with these problems through the first two decades of this century. And while we've seen historic gun safety reforms in Virginia, we're facing yet another threat in the massive numbers of arms that we've seen in demonstrations on our streets and in so many places. So, so today, we'll talk about guns. We'll talk about guns, safety, and healing. My interest in this history stemmed from my work as an editor for the Richmond Times Dispatch on April 16th, 2007, the day of the shootings. I arrived on campus about four o'clock that afternoon to organize and edit the newspaper's coverage and stayed there over the next two days. 32 students and professors were slain on that unseasonably cold morning. At the time, it was the nation's largest contemporary mass shooting and would retain that sad distinction until the 2016 shootings at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando where 49 were killed. Just over a year later, 58 were slain at the country music concert in Las Vegas. But this book is not my reflection of that week. 
or a journalist's memoir. Though I thought deeply at the time about the consequences of the tragedy and whether it could influence how the state and the nation consider the problems of gun violence, it was more in the context of planning daily news coverage. And when I returned to Richmond later that week, I felt a sense that what happened at Virginia Tech would have a lasting effect, that the state could rally around this torn community and enact gun safety legislation and other measures that would make our state safer and honor the memories of those killed. This picture is the, the, the beginning of the sea of satellite trucks and uh, news crews outside the Alumni Center uh, at Virginia Tech, which is uh, connected to the inn at Virginia Tech. Uh, uh, we just wanted to give you an idea of what that looked like as we, as we walked in that day. But my sense of optimism dimmed as I saw little change over the next three years. What I instead saw that was that even while tech families were undergoing their own physical and emotional healing, they were engaged in mighty struggles from accountability questions regarding what took place before, during, and after the mass shootings to the realities of advocating gun safety legislation during an era of expanding gun rights, most notably the Supreme Court's Heller decision in 2008. And this came during a time of repeated mass shootings, you might remember. I thought there was a broader story to tell here and began reporting for this book on the week of the third anniversary at Virginia Tech, the third anniversary memorial. I learned that a few days after the memorial, there would be an armed gun rights demonstration in Northern Virginia. A decade later, of course, I see this as a precursor of what we observed earlier this year at the state capitol in Richmond. The weaponry and gear seemed to have increased over the years, but the rhetoric that day was the same and remains dangerous. 10 years ago, I would have called this type of display insensitivity at best. But what I came to learn more over the years is the re-traumatization that this brings on, not only for gun violence survivors, but for their families and friends and communities. With repeated mass shootings in the years after the tech tragedy, re-traumatization at that time seemed to be inescapable. Shooting survivor Colin Goddard shown here at a 2008 demonstration at Capitol Square in Richmond, talks about this re-traumatization in a chapter of my book that I titled with his words, Back to Day One. In that chapter, I report on the work of advocates during the weeks after the shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Congress, of course, failed to approve gun safety legislation in the, after the attack on first graders and her teachers that shocked the nation. President Obama called it a shameful day. He was echoing the words of Virginian Lori Haas, who shouted, shame on you from the Senate gallery with Tucson, Arizona gun safety activist, Patricia Mache. Many people correctly see the defeat that day as a low point, but at the same time, others recognize it as the start of a movement, not the end. Colin, who was shot in the French class, went on to become an advocate for the Brady campaign to prevent gun violence, and later, every town for gun safety. In Richmond, meantime, Colin's father, Andrew Goddard, became a top advocate. In this picture, Andrew is helping Colin to the podium to speak at the memorial service for the slain French professor, Jocelyn Couture Novak. Andrew Goddard, along with Lori Haas, became among the leading gun safety advocates at the Virginia Capitol. And it was their work that set the table for the historic legislation that we saw passed in this session of the General Assembly. Lori is to the far right of Governor Kane in this photo from 2007. At the center is her daughter, Emily, who was shot in the French class. Colin Goddard had been on his cell phone to police during the attack when the phone flew from his hands. Emily picked it up, hid it from the shooter, and kept an open line to police. 
This is a picture of Colin testifying on Capitol Hill, not long after the shootings. Colin believed he had made a complete recovery physically. And in the years that I reported on his activities, he always appeared fit and healthy. But in 2017, around the time of the 10th anniversary of the Tech shootings, Colin learned that bullet fragments left in his body were causing high blood lead levels in his blood and concerns of lead poisoning. He went through an invasive surgery, much like a hip replacement, to clean out some of the fragments, but others remained in areas that were too problematic for surgeons. The recovery from surgery was similar to how he recovered after the shootings. First a wheelchair, then a walker, then a cane. This all came as a surprise to Colin. After the shootings, doctors told him that some fragments would need to stay in, but they would not be causing him any problems. But over time, the thinking of doctors changed on this subject. In the, in the meantime, Colin has been testing different strategies for reducing the lead level. But as a young father, he remains concerned about the possible long-term effects of lead poisoning. Colin has also considered whether it would be possible to play a role in further study on the dangers of fragments, maybe even involving other survivors who he's met over the years. Colin rode to campus that morning with his friend, Christina Anderson. They were running late and I even considered skipping French class, but thought it was important to be there as it was late in the semester. Christina began a foundation as an undergraduate after recovering from her gunshot wounds. The Kashka Foundation now works in training police officers, school administrators, and first responders on the needs of survivors and in helping students create safer communities. And she also does important work in connect connecting survivors of tragedies so they can bond, uh, learn from one another, uh, and, and discuss their experiences. Originally, I saw my book as focusing nearly exclusively on Second Amendment issues. But Christina Anderson's focus on overall safety and healing helps broaden this history and explains the and helps explain the complexities of recovery. This is Christina on campus in a picture taken by Samuel Granillo, a Columbine High School survivor who visited Virginia Tech as part of his own healing quest. Some of you may have seen this in an, in an NBC Dateline special in 2014. And this is Christina with on the left, her right, Frank DeAngelis, the retired principal from Columbine High School. They've appeared together at many training and educational forums. In the months leading up to the 10th anniversary memorial at Tech, a new voice emerged to speak up for the experiences of the needs of non-physically injured survivors. Lisa Hamp was a student in a classroom where the gunman tried to enter twice, but was repelled by students who had successfully barricaded the door. For years, Lisa suffered from PTSD, but was in denial. She told me that outwardly, she was resilient and strong. She was accomplished in her career, but inside she churned with nightmares, an eating disorder, and a compulsion to exercise. But she talked herself out of confirming that her problems were, were related to the shootings until 2015, when her inability to conceive led her to consider counseling. She'd go on to make great strides and became an advocate for the needs of non-physically injured survivors, people who witnessed the same horror, but weren't physically wounded. She's lent an import, important voice in the field of healing and has inspired girls and young women in her audiences. And she's now the mother of two girls. And as you can see here in this, as you can see here in this picture, she's talking very frankly about um, the events of April 16th, 2007. Behind her, you can see the picture of um, police running, um, running toward the scene in Blacksburg, a, a photo that's become well known over the years. While we think we can begin to understand the trauma 
healing and recovery problems of survivors, sometimes going unnoticed as the work of police. No amount of training can prepare officers for the level of gun violence they see in our society today in terms of mass shootings and the horrors of responding to the deaths of young people. Two Blacksburg police chaplains and their colleague on the Blacksburg Police Force have worked to help hundreds of officers from Virginia and other states since the tech tragedy. From the foreground here, this is Lieutenant Kit Cummings, Pastor Alec Evans, and Pastor Tommy McDearis. Together, they formed the Virginia Law Enforcement Assistance Program, known as VA LEAP. It was a direct outgrowth of their own work with officers after the tech shootings. Alec was then a pastor of Blacksburg Presbyterian Church, and Tommy was pastor of Blacksburg Baptist Church. Alec is now pastor of Second Presbyterian in downtown Richmond. Kit has since retired from the Blacksburg Police Force. All three were on duty the day of the shootings. Alec and Tommy were among the clergy who informed family members of the deaths of loved ones. Because not every state has an organization like VA LEAP, this group has also helped police from afar, including troopers who responded at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Beth Hilscher is the mother of Emily Hilscher. Emily was one of the two students killed in the dormitory before the mass shootings later that morning at the classroom building, Norris Hall. Beth lives in Richmond and has been a member of the State Board of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. In the quest for accountability in the aftermath of the shootings, there are many different directions that were taken. Gun policy, the university's delay in issuing a warning after the first shootings, and the treatment of family members were all among the many topics that came under scrutiny. Beth and her family became deeply involved in the threshold question of why the gunman was allowed to be a student at Virginia Tech in the first place. Sung Wee Cho had a history of emotional and mental health problems and received detailed care and counseling through the Fairfax County Public Schools. He was thought to be doing better by his senior year in high school. He insisted on going to Virginia Tech, although his parents and others thought the school was too big and too far away. So he went into this new environment without any of the safety net that he had in Fairfax. Beth has been an advocate for creating a program that would be a bridge or safety net that a young person could take from high school to college or the working world. This is Beth with her daughter, Erica, calling on Senator Cree Deeds. Senator Deeds, of course, suffered his own family tragedy in 2013 when his son committed suicide after attacking his father. Gus Deeds had been released from an emergency custody order without a psychiatric bed having been found for him. This has led to a long re-examination of the state's mental health procedures. Beth Hilscher is also concerned about fading memories. She told me how a meeting room would fall silent when she introduced herself as the mother of a student at Virginia Tech. Now she senses that doesn't make as much of an impact. Another parent told me that over a period of time, he felt as if some, he felt as if some saw tech as old news. And then he added, I understand that. Uma Loganathan is the daughter of the slain professor G.V. Loganathan. I spoke with her in a Virginia Tech engineering library named for her father. You can see his portrait here in the upper right-hand corner of this picture. She also expressed concerns about how the tech community will be remembered over the years. She told me, I say it with great pride when I say, my father was a professor at Virginia Tech. She said it hurts when she contemplates how all the good in her father, his colleagues, and his students can be seen by some as second to the way they died. She said, to be defined by only that forever is a terrible thing. Yet Uma also worries about a changing campus, younger students, and, and the potential loss of empathy. 
Finding that balance is really hard, she said, but it still points to the overriding objective that the students and professors of April 16th, 2007 must never be forgotten. Tom. Yes. Am, am, I, am I interrupting? No. With questions. Um, I've jotted down a couple of questions as other people maybe gather their thoughts and think of them too. Um, I'm thinking about the comment you just made about tech becoming old news to somebody. And I'm wondering, does younger students and a loss of empathy affect these survivors? And can you comment? You know, I think that was a question mark uh, prior to the 10th anniversary memorial. And uh, there was a, a huge turnout for that uh, with many, obviously with many of the current students, a, a beautiful atmosphere that day. And um, I, I think that um, it's an amazing, the Virginia Tech community and its network is, uh, is amazing. And I think that, um, I think memories are being held. I think that the, having the April 16th Memorial uh, as a focus point is very, is very important. I'll talk a little bit later about that. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about that in our discussion. Um, I've, you know, I've been to Virginia Tech many times and I've never failed to see people stop by the April 16th Memorial to pay respects. They, they stop carrying boxes of papers. They stop while they're clearly going from class one place or another. Um, you can, park your car out there, <laughs> there's still some parking spaces on the, on the rotary around the, the drill field. Um, and it's, it's rare to see it completely empty. So I think, um, I think that it is, a, I think, I think the mem memories have endured. Okay. So even though it's been more than 10 years and some of these, some of the students who are coming were toddlers, when all this happened, they remember because of the school's institutional memory. Is that what you're saying? I think I think it takes I think it takes place how they how they learn about it and how they remember it. I think that I think that comes about in different I think that comes about in different ways. Okay, so um, Jerry Handler has written in as a question. He thanks you for your talk and asks if you can summarize briefly what's changed in Virginia with respect to guns as a direct result of the Virginia Tech massacre. Okay, um, that will be something I'll be getting to very shortly. So if it's oh, okay with you, we please can- Please go ahead. Good, and thank, you, and thank you to Jerry and for the other person who asked the question. And, and Jeannie, to follow up um, on the point that just made, the, um, the impact of mass violence across generations. Um, the impact of mass violence across generations uh, was something that I observed while reporting on this book from Texas, uh, where John Woods, a 2007 Virginia Tech graduate, his girlfriend, Maxine Turner, was killed in the shootings. John became involved in the movement against allowing concealed carry on college campuses. John began graduate studies at the University of Texas the summer after the Tech shootings. In Austin, he found himself in the shadow of the university's tower where a student, Charles Whitman, opened fire in 1966. It's an attack that many people, where many people start when they consider the history of public mass shootings in the United States. John founded a prominent gun safety group in Texas and he was honored by the White House for his advocacy. During his time at UT, the community became embroiled in a debate over whether concealed weapons should be allowed on campus. John's group helped forestall that, though it eventually became law on August the 1st, 2016, which happened to be the 50 year anniversary of the shootings in, at, at Austin. During his time in Texas, John made connections with survivors of the 1966 shootings who also opposed concealed carry on campus. One of the survivors with whom John became friends is Claire Wilson James. She was the first person shot by Whitman. She was 18 years old and eight months pregnant and the gunfire killed her baby. As Claire's boyfriend kneeled to help, he was fatally shot. This is Claire moments before the start of the 50th anniversary memorial in Austin. 
she's standing just steps away from where she lay bleeding for about an hour and a half that August 1st, 1966, before she was heroically rescued by two young men who braved the sniper's fire. There are more connections between these two mass shootings that are generations apart. Many of the Texas survivors told me that the moving on attitude of 1966 resulted in them not being able to properly mourn or memorialize their community. One survivor told me he felt this when he learned about the Memorial of Hokie Stones at Virginia Tech, which of course you see in this picture. The recognition of how this memorial took place in Blacksburg helped influence a new memorial at the University of Texas that was dedicated on August the 1st, 2016. And it was the first memorial in Texas to include the names of those who lost their lives. In examining the experiences of these two generations, a half century apart during a time of so many mass shootings, also leads me to think about where we are, where we stand now as a society. What can we further do to make sure that future generations read this as a history and not as their reality? Of course, we saw historic progress at the Virginia Capitol this spring as the new Democratic majorities in the House and Senate under the leadership of a Democratic governor, enacted gun safety legislation in the aftermath of the mass shootings of 12 at the Virginia Beach Municipal Center on May 31st, 2019. But it also took a power shift at the Capitol. Governor Northam, you may remember, had originally called a special session for last July, but Republican legislators, then in the majority in the House and Senate, shut it down within an hour and a half. Gun safety became a campaign issue, much as it had been in the previous year in the 2018 elections for the United States House of Representatives, and Virginia Democrats took control of both chambers. The bills that passed included universal background checks, extreme risk protection orders, and reinstating the one handgun a month purchase limit. One handgun a month had been enacted during Governor Douglas Wyler's administration in 1993. But General Assembly Republicans repealed it in 2012, just weeks before the fifth anniversary of the tech shootings. Other bills that were passed this spring included reporting requirements for lost and stolen weapons, toughening the penalty for recklessly allowing children access to firearms, giving localities more authority to regulate firearms in public places, and prohibiting weapon possession for people subject to protective orders. Only one key element of the package that was backed by the governor failed to pass, an assault weapons ban. And of course that could come up again next year. These were changes that Lori Haas and Andrew Goddard and others had sought and fought for for years. In this picture, they are in the House of Delegates gallery flanking Barbara Parker, whose daughter, WDBJ journalist Allison Parker, and her colleague, Adam Ward, were fatally shot during an on-the-air broadcast in August 2015 at Smith Mountain Lake. Barbara's husband, Andy Parker, wrote this book for Allison. He's not only been an outspoken advocate for gun control, but also he has dogged social media giants, YouTube, and Facebook to remove from their sites murder videos that have been posted by the killer. On the legislative front, it was Virginia's turn to act, as I said, after the U.S. House of Representatives turned Democratic in 2018. This is uh, a story by Amy Friedenberger of the Roanoke Times. Um, the headline, quote, we're not going away. Virginia Tech families long fight for gun control. This is Lori Haas here with uh, Public Safety and Homeland Security Secretary Brian Moran. Let's go back to 2018. Earlier that year in 2018, the young survivors and advocates who became nationally known after the shootings at Marjory Stoneman Douglas High School focused attention on the need for reforms. 
the Parkland students and parents began a sustained fight for change right away, marshalling social media in a way that hadn't been done before. I talked to some of the Virginia Tech students, graduates now, um, in 2018, and they indeed saw themselves, some, they saw themselves in the advocacy of the uh, Marjorie Stone and Douglas students and families. Um, of course, um, social media and its, its incredibly rapid ability to reach people was truly in its infancy in 2007. I think the first iPhone uh, came, out, came out in 2007. Um, but th over the years, we've seen how social media can reach people so, so quickly to positive effects, and of course, uh, negative effects as, as well, but used to great effect by the Marjorie Stone and Douglas students. So their work really had the effect of further va validating and amplifying the voices of survivors from Virginia Tech, Newtown, and everywhere where gun tragedy has struck and that survivor movements and advocacy has, has grown. Kristen Goss uh, is a prominent Duke University scholar and author of an excellent book, The Gun Debate, uh, which was just updated and is a, a terrific primer and guide to any question that anyone might have about um, the gun debate. She says that the Virginia Tech families who supported gun safety legislation Deserve, deserve credit for helping develop a template for organizing family members and survivors. And indeed, um, they, have been to many, they have been to many places and talked to many folks. Still, the long journeys of healing are just beginning for so many in our state and nation. Going back to that summer of 2019, after the Virginia Beach shootings on May 31st, the New York Times reported that by Labor Day, 126 people were killed in 26 mass shootings. The headline called it, An American Summer Stained in Blood. This is a picture in maybe a day or two, a few days after the shootings in Virginia Beach, outside another one of the buildings where people came to leave uh, tributes and, and, and flowers. One of the members of the Virginia Beach City Council, Aaron Rouse, was a senior at Virginia Tech in 2007. He recalled at a city council meeting earlier this year how some students had to jump to safety from the windows of Norris Hall, and he, hold, he held his hands apart just a little to show the small dimensions of those windows. But gun rights proponents, meantime, have sought to normalize the display of weapons and the threat of force as a political tool. If fueled by the rhetoric of President Trump, they've turned out in force in the streets of Richmond and other places we've seen, Lansing, Michigan, and, even, and they've even been joined by out-of-town law officers who took part in demonstrations here in Richmond. One of the new gun laws allowing localities to ban guns at events that require permits. Permits, for example, for blocking off streets um, can help. But it could be up to the legislature to take another look at Virginia's status as a state that largely permits open carry. Some of this is dependent, of course, on what happens this election day at the federal and local levels. But the fact that we've seen fatal shootings involving demonstrations this year ought to serve notice that more needs to be done to make our communities safer. We've seen an increase in deadly armed hate crime across our country, a fact all too well known in Charlottesville and mass shootings in Charleston, Pittsburgh, El Paso, and many other places. And this morning, I wrote a, wrote a note down as I was getting ready. Uh, CNN had a report this morning that um, a, new, a new draft report by the Department of Homeland Security shows that white supremacy is our most lethal threat. Joshua Horwitz uh, is a Virginian and the director of the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. And he wrote a book 
now 10 years back, called Guns, Democracy, and the Insurrectionist Idea. Josh is, has lobbied in, in Richmond with the Virginia Tech um, community uh, as a lawyer and um, legal scholar. He says that now this insurrectionist movement has found voice in the White House during the critical period leading up to Election Day. In an op-ed that he wrote this summer, he said, it's no, it's no coincidence that insurrectionism creeped out of the shadows as America's first black president came into office. And it should be no surprise that Trump is using these same grievances to mobilize insurrectionists against state governments. Some of Trump's sharpest jabs have been directed at new gun laws in Virginia, shepherded through by Virginia's first female speaker of the house and at a female governor of Michigan who has been designated as the enemy. In fear of power, in fear of losing power, losing control to people who do not look like them, Josh wrote, the guns come out in armed rallies in Richmond and in Lansing, and of course in other places. Of course, gun violence or threats are not limited to mass gatherings. Gun violence continues to tear at our neighborhoods every day in shootings that fail to get as much attention. And these homicides have struck close to home over the past two years. Shakita Mitchell, a mother of seven, was fatally shot in Richmond this summer on an evening in which a 15-year-old was killed and a three-year-old was wounded. Last year, Nine-year-old Markiah Dixon was shot during a cookout at a city park. Governor Northam mentioned her in his call for the special session in 2019. While all this has been going on, gun sales continue to rise. It's a complex path to safety and healing that stretches from Washington to our state capitals and into our neighborhoods. The continuing work of gun, gun violence survivors, advocates, and health experts in this time of pandemic should command attention and help inform ways to save lives at this most critical time in our history. We've heard so much about, and properly so, about listening to scientists, listening to the experts to help us um, defend ourselves during the pandemic crisis. There's also a, a large body of thought about how gun violence should be treated as a public health problem, um, much in the way that, much in the way that our country looked at automobile safety in the 1960s, when President Johnson uh, selected um, an epidemiologist to be the first director of what will become uh, the National Highway Safety um, Administration. Uh, there's ample evidence to show that looking at behaviors, looking at ways to reduce the flow of guns, because all crime guns begin as legally manufactured weapons available for purchase by, com by consumers, that steps taken together uh, can help make us safer. There's not one law or one set of laws that will, that are, that will magically rid us of this problem but taking all these steps together, increasing our consciousness um, can help inform ways to save lives at this most critical time in our history. So I uh, thank you all very much and I'm glad to answer any questions or discuss, um, discuss further um, what I've talked about today. Thank you. Okay. Thanks Tom. We have, we do have a couple of questions coming in um, and it, sort of follows on what you talked about toward the end of your uh, presentation. Um, Kirk White notes that he is a proud Hokie and equally saddened by the Virginia Tech shooting, but he is questioning, wasn't the Virginia Beach mass shooting, didn't it happen in a gun-free zone? That's a question he asks. As to whether, what the regulations were for the... For Virginia Beach. Right. Well, you know that uh, that gun-free zones uh, question comes up um, comes up frequently. Kirk, I appreciate uh, you asking the question. I've I had a picture ready to show, and uh, I think as a Virginia Tech um, alum, you love seeing this picture of the of the turnout um, 
of the turnout there. You know, the gun-free zones, people intent on defying the law, intent on um, create, causing a violent act, um, they will, if they're bent on getting in somewhere, then they will, they will go, whether it's, they will, they will, they will, it's possible for them to get in. Um, but having gun-free zones, having deterrence, and again, as I said, not one single um, measure will keep us all safe. But the more deterrence we have in place, I think, and, and many advocates believe, having deterrence in place, a series of deterrence, uh, rather than relying on the notion that allowing everyone to have a weapon um, is a better path to safety. Okay, that sort of um, gets to the answer to another question Kirk had, which was, doesn't additional gun control laws, don't additional gun control laws require larger police forces to enforce the laws? Um, and it seems as though most police departments, he noticed, are currently being defunded. I think, the, I think police departments right now are, I think police departments right now are not precisely being defunded, at, you know, as we've seen in a, and we've seen, as we've seen in a discussion, that term defunding, I think it really has come to mean, um, to mean lots of different things. Um, how we can, how the money can be best, how the money that's allocated for police departments can be best used um, and other questions. Um, I think in place, I think in Virginia, we're unlikely to see um, complete defunding of police departments in large scale. However, I think we are seeing some questions about how um, how policing uh, takes place. Um, in the Kristen Goss book, uh, The Gun Debate, um, she outlines two steps that would be positive. Um, enforcing gun law, enforcing gun laws, um, have greater enforcement of gun laws by police and by our courts, and also um, de-escalating the, de -escalating the use of firearms by police, which we are obviously, um, which is obviously a large question right now. There have been some additional, it does take some additional uh, personnel to, um, to do uh, some of the measures that have been put into place, but they to me seem uh, reasonable numbers compared to the overall employment levels um, in state government and state and local governments. So I think that, um, I think also, I think a lot of there are so many great and dedicated police officers and police chiefs, I think working together with communities on identifying ways for improvement. I think it's possible for, for police departments to have adequate funding and protect us and themselves from, uh, from, from gunfire. Because the last thing the police want to do is go into a situation uh, where they can't identify who the perpetrator is. It's very, it's, it's a very high, it's a very perilous situation. Yeah, so from the um, talk that you've given and some of the pictures that you've shown, it's pretty clear that you have talked with policemen, but um, Robert Hand has written in and wondered to know um, if you have talked to or consulted with anyone who's actually knowledgeable about guns. Um, sort of, I guess that's, includes, sure. includes the policemen, but not necessarily. Yeah. Sure, and you know, one person who I, who I did interview and who was uh, featured in a chapter in the book is uh, Nick Rowland, who um, was also a graduate of Virginia Tech in 2007. And Nick um, um, felt like the way that he wanted to respond um, to the tragedy was to go ahead with his plans that he already had to get his uh, concealed weapons permit um, after the shootings, after he graduated. And he is in opposition to um, additional gun safety laws. And I spoke with him at length, and uh, he, he, has a chapter, he has a chapter in my book. Um, Nick uh, lived in Austin, and, or lived in Austin, and I would not say that he was a vocal gun rights advocate, 
but his views came more to be known in Austin during the time of the debate there over concealed carry on campus. So uh, he is very devoted to the tech community, and I know there are others who who share those who share those views. And I also um, took um, I also took a a class in um, basic pistol shooting as part of my research. Um, so I'm not a, so I, I, I have talked with people who know about guns and, and I've also spoken with police and, um, and, and, and heard police talk about uh, these really critical moments that take place when they respond to uh, scenes where active gunfire is still going on. Sure. So a question that I have had for actually a long time knowing about this book, but more specifically after hearing your talk today, is what happens to you emotionally when news breaks of another shooting? That has gotten, for me, more and more difficult as time has, as time has gone on. Um, uh, as a journalist, one of the, I guess one of the last major stories I, added, I edited at the paper was the coverage of uh, the shootings of Allison Parker and Adam Ward. Um, one of my friends from college, uh, we'd lost contact over the years, but we worked at the, at the college newspaper together, uh, was one of the five people shot um, at the Capital Gazette newspaper in Annapolis. And uh, that, that took place uh, toward the completion of the book. I was able to write a little bit about it in, in the book. Um, and all of these, um, all of the shootings have become more difficult to, um, to get through as, as time has, as time has gone on, uh, looking back on it, um, it, it, it seems to be without question, a natural a response to learning more about uh, how difficult it is for people to, um, face the challenges that come after gun violence. And I think that uh, sometimes, and this is not, not to fault daily newspaper coverage because it was my, my life for nearly 40 years, um, but I think um, one of the reasons I did this book was I wanted people to understand better what happens over the long term. And in, and in doing so, I've, I've kind of created a longer term uh, for myself, whereas I've learned more um, and talked to more people about their experiences. It does become more uh, difficult with, e with each, uh, with each uh, awful incident. So essentially you're a bit of a victim as well through all of this, even though it was your attempt to learn more about it. Is that what I'm oh yeah, but I wouldn't call myself, uh, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I'm a, I wouldn't say that I'm a victim. Um, no more than in the sense that um, we all share we all share a burden in our society when we see what's going on and and have some concern about trying to make things better. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, we've pretty much filled an hour, uh, and I think we've hit on most of the questions um, that pertain to what you wrote about. And so I would take this opportunity to thank you for talking and remind everyone that they can um, view a recording of this presentation on the Virginia Humanities Facebook page, as well as it will probably be posted on the Virginia Humanities main webpage as well. We'll have uh, another talk two weeks from now on a Tuesday from one of the um, researchers who was at the Library of Virginia. Uh, Tracy Roof was researching the history of food stamps in this country and will report back to us um, in a talk that's promoted as well through the Virginia Humanities. So again, thank you all for tuning in today. And um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Jeannie. And I just wanted to end, uh, end by thanking everyone again who attended and of course, thanking everyone at the at Humanities. And, um, I chose a, a tranquil picture to share with everyone at the end of the, these are the pylons above the War Memorial chapter as it looks out over the drill field on a, on a beautiful evening in, in, uh, in Blacksburg. And I'd like to 
wish everyone the best and good health uh, and good health and safety in the in the coming months. And thank you all for uh, for setting this up. And thanks to everyone who attended. Okay. Thank you, Tom.